Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. You are listening to a rebroadcast of a previously recorded show. We're live at the Monty Book Fair, Neil Haley Show, powered by Life Improvement Radio. You can go to neilhaley.com, and we have the Perseverance Network, and also monteybookfair.com and lifeimprovementradio.com, and many different channels for Eric Remmel and different things. And I already know our producer, we got to keep rolling. We can't, we're going to get some stories of Eric and Peter throughout this uh, broadcast, but right now we do have author Maya Jasanoff on the program. Maya, how are you? Hi, good, thanks. You're the author of The Dawn Watch. Uh, thanks again for calling. And you know what? When I start thinking about, and, and it's Joseph Conrad in the Global World, we'll get to that very soon. But is this the first time you've attended as an author at the Miami Book Fair? It is, yeah. What do you think so far? Now you can really kind of look at it a little bit differently. It's Sunday. You were here Saturday and the different festivities. It's something for, that is pretty amazing, isn't it? The yeah, street. I had a look around yesterday. I, it's really impressive to see all the different publishers who are out here, all kinds of different language publishers and just a huge range of presses that you wouldn't normally see in you know, your Barnes & Nobles. So it's really terrifically vibrant that way. Oh, absolutely. And then your background, to kind of understand why you've written your book, tell us a little bit of your background, uh, Maya, so we can go right into specifically your book and stuff. Sure. Well, I'm a history professor, um, and I'm also, uh, like many Americans, I'm somebody who comes from a partly immigrant background. My mother comes from India. My father's American. And ever since uh, I was a kid, I've been traveling a lot around the world and with my family and then by myself. And I've always been interested in the way that cultures and people come together. And of course, sometimes they collide as well. Um, and that's really informed all of the historical work that I've done throughout my career. Wow. Inter- very, very uh, interesting. And so kind of putting that perspective of history and the global world, you know history repeats itself, Maya. That's what history professors try to teach their students, especially when a lot of them sometimes come into your class like, oh, do I really, especially today, I really, do, I, do I really need to know history? Maya, you see and I see in how we are just watching the cyclical history in the past 200 years and or more that we we make mistakes so much from history, don't we? Because we just don't study it. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a phrase that I think historians prefer, which is that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. That is, there's <laughs> often echoes that we have. And uh, the way that I think about it, though, is a little different. It's that I mean, I do think we need to know what happened in the past because it shapes the world we live in today. And I, I think of it more in the way you might think of inheritance or ancestry or genealogy or something, you know, in the same way that you know who your parents are often or whoever raised you and you get something from that and you know how it affects your choices as you go forward. You know, we need to know about the world that we came from so that we can move forward and into the world that we've got. And the way that I look at it also, particularly for college students, is to think about history as just about being in time. You know, we live in time. It's a dimension of our lives. And we all need to make decisions for ourselves and for our families and for our society over time. And and the best way to kind of understand how time works is to spend a little time studying it. And that's really what history is about. Absolutely. You know, um, I had a a question on that, just kind of a thought going into more of a technical age. Uh, Do you think history is going to be... more so test or is it going to be more so blurred kind of like the ability of like social media online networks you know like because we used to have specifically books as references for history but now history and moments are just everywhere all over the web on people's phones uh what are your thoughts on that Well, you know, I think of history, another of the things that you get by studying history is the ability to deal with data. You know, one of the things I say to my students is that history is the biggest data field there is. You know, basically everything that ever happened is part of your part of your data set. And this generation right now, everybody who's living right now in the world is the best documented generation that has ever lived in in the history of the earth. And there is more stuff that we are producing and more record keeping and more storytelling and more personal history writing. You know, somebody's Facebook feed is like their 
memoir in a way. And, you know, as you say, the, the, the concept of the moment, you know, people are recording this all the time. So, I mean, I do think it creates a challenge for future scholars because it's going to be hard to, we're going to have to use different techniques for filtering through all of this stuff. But if anything, I think that it's going to make people more invested in trying to kind of figure out what's going on because this urge to document our passage through this world seems to be stronger than ever. Yeah. Most definitely, and video and audio, all sorts of different things. Totally. Called, yeah. I can definitely, I can definitely agree with that. Because personally, being an avid social media person myself, I can definitely relate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's kind of let's go into who now why you've written this book, The Dawn Wash, Joseph Con- Conrad in a Global World. Who is Joseph Conrad for people that do not know, especially my diverse so, audience of of listeners that listen to all my podcasts and syndication and stuff. Yeah. Sure. So Joseph Conrad was a novelist, um, and he's uh, he lived in the late 19th, early 20th century. He wrote most of his books around 1900, and um, he is widely recognized as a major modernist novelist. He was kind of a cutting-edge person in terms of style, and, and the book that he's best known for um, is called Heart of Darkness. It's a short novel. It's assigned in a lot of high schools and colleges today, but I think most people are more familiar with a movie that was made on the basis of it, and that movie is Apocalypse Now, the uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie Uh from the 70s, um, which takes the story of Heart of Darkness, which is about a guy going up and down a river in Africa, and it puts it into the Vietnam War. Um, And that is what Conrad is best known for, but he wrote fiction that was set all over the world and that features people who are put into situations where things are kind of going wrong around them and they have to figure out uh, what the right thing to do is. Wow. Very, very interesting. Eric, are you a fan of Apocalypse Now? Because you're a movie kind of guy and stuff, Eric. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 a fan of all types of creative uh, works, you know, um, and it's really interesting to me this subject line. What? How did you kind of come up with the idea for the for the book? Was there something particular that just really, you know, started that for you? Something you're interested in? Yeah, so what really struck me about the work of this guy, Joseph Conrad, is that, um, again, he's best known for this novel that is set in Africa and that can be transposed to Vietnam. So right away, we've got a really kind of global, you know, international focus there. Um, But then he also wrote novels that seemed to me in really remarkable ways to look ahead into our own times. Even though he was writing around 1900, he wrote a novel about terrorism in London. This is circa 1900. He's writing about a bomb plot in London that's... um, you know, put up, put together by foreign agents, and it could just as well be happening right now. It could be out of the pages of John le Carre or something like that. Um, He also wrote tons of novels that were set in Asia and set on ships, Um, and a lot of people actually know him as an author about the sea. Um, And then he also wrote a book about um, a a revolution in Latin America, and uh, it deals with capitalism and uh, political uh, agitation, and if you read that novel, you might as well be reading about some of the things that are going on these days and some of the issues in places like Venezuela today. So I really found this an amazing global reach of all of this stuff, and it all, even though it comes from 100-something years ago, it just seemed like I was reading stories that might as well come out of the newspaper today. And then just to kind of put the, the cherry on top, Joseph Conrad was actually born uh, in present-day Ukraine, and he was Polish. And he didn't even learn the English language until his early 20s. And he became one of the great writers in English fiction without speaking a word of English until his 20s. Wow. You know, when you you talk about Joseph Conrad, what did you learn? Because you knew a lot about him before writing this book. But what new things did you learn by writing the book? About you know, I actually didn't know a whole lot about him before <laughs> writing the book, which is partly why you write books, is to learn a lot more about something you're intrigued by. I, so I think for me, just understanding that this guy, who I knew as a name on the spine of a book, had an incredibly rich life, that was one of the key takeaways for me, and that <laughs> his life basically enacted some of the things that I found in his work. So like I said, he was born in um, what was then part of the Tsarist Russian Empire, 
he, as a teenager, he was orphaned. He then ended up becoming a, an immigrant. He went to France, and then he went to England. Um, so all of that kind of experience of being somebody crossing borders and learning new languages, I didn't really know much about. And then another piece of what he did, um, which I hadn't known about, is that for 20 years before he ever became a writer, he actually had a different career, and that career was that he was a professional sailor. And he was working on long-haul sailing ships going all over the world from England to the Caribbean to uh, Australia to Southeast Asia, also to Africa. Uh, and his books were all more or less based on his own personal experiences. So this was a person who not only witnessed and kind of lived through a period of enormous global change, kind of like the period we're in now, but also kind of embodied it in his own personal experience. Very interesting. Then that's the that's the the most interesting part about uh, this festival is learning from new people, Maya. And I'm sure you were intrigued by books you're going to pick up and read after attending this this book fair, right? There's people I'm now sure. that you've seen and you you say I want to research more, and it gets you more interested. And that's what's so great about it, being an educator, Maya, is the possibility to learn new things. I think if we can be educated. The rest of our lives, we really become so well-rounded to deal with many different people if we educate ourselves. Totally. And, you know, for me, that's really the, it's, of course, what drives me in my own life. I'm very lucky to have a career where I can devote myself to the pursuit of things I'm interested in. But what I really encourage students or just anyone in the world to do is just be curious. You know, go out there and try to try to encounter something that's different and unfamiliar and try to just at least for a few minutes understand, you know, put yourself in that position and think about what that situation might feel like from the inside. Absolutely. I think if we can all do that, we will have a, a better and more harmonious society. And Peter, from you, since you met me, you've seen me learn a lot of new things that I didn't know before. And Peter has learned a lot of other things from our relationship, the same as the same with Eric, Peter. But Peter, can you expound anything on the question for Maya? Yeah, I was the question I had for the book is kind of like, what are you looking for uh, for readers to take away besides kind of learning uh, the history and learning the aspects of the book? So what I want people to take away, I think, is the sense that we've been here before. It comes back to what we were talking about right at the beginning of this segment, that that globalization, yeah. which is a word that we use a lot today and that connotes all the ways in which we're interconnected, is something that the world has experienced before. It, we experienced it about 100 years ago. and. It had some of the pros and cons we're seeing today. There were a lot of people who you know, were immigrants who benefited from that. There was technological change that made the conditions of life better for some people. But there was also pushback. You know, There were people who felt they were losing their jobs because of new technology. There were people who were concerned about immigrants coming in and changing the nature of their countries or taking jobs or whatever. And that earlier yeah. world of globalization ended in – bloodshed in World War One and later in World War Two. And my hope is that our current moment does not take us to anything like that right now. Um, but I think um, I personally am kind of concerned about some of the ways that people are becoming, it seems to me, more kind of tribal right now and some of the ways that we are. Yeah. But, but equally, some of the ways that the champions of globalization are losing sight, you know, of the people who are losing mm -hmm. out. So I, I would like readers to come away from it and th thinking about that and thinking about the way that, frankly, we're in a very complex world. It's, it's too easy to say, you know, oh, I disagree with you on this subject and I'm not going to talk to you. You know, we have to be prepared to deal with the multiple forces going on. And we have to be able to think about this seriously from the perspective of both the winners and the losers so that we can move forward without destroying our, our planet in the process. Wow. Most definitely. Eric, anything to expound on before we let uh, Maya go? That's a quick question. What, what's in the future? I mean, this is a, a pretty cool topic, and it sounds like it's a, a passion for you. You got any future projects you're working on currently? Yeah, I'm actually um, going to be developing this issue of uh, ancestry and genealogy um, because I'm really interested, as I told you, in the ways that people are connected um, and have been connected throughout human history. And uh, I actually just taught a course uh, at Harvard on this topic, looking at the last uh, 200,000 years of human history through the ways in which we think about ancestry and kinship. And uh, not sure where it's going to go yet, but I plan to develop a, a book project about that. 
Fantastic. Exciting. Oh, that's that's great and exciting. Where's the best place we can find info on you? Purchase your book and learn more about you. Where can we go? Uh, well, hopefully you can go to any major bookstore and find my book, and you can uh, Google me. And uh, I'm on the Harvard University website. I'm on Facebook. I've just joined Instagram. So hope you can <laughs> check it out and hope people enjoy it. Well, Maya, I would love to connect with you. Uh, I'll have to follow you on Instagram because uh, that's the new one I'm trying. I'm almost at 10,000 followers on Instagram, wow. uh, my platform. But uh, I, I love to connect. And, uh, man, I, as, as an, uh, having an undergrad in history, I wish I could sit in on a Harvard class and see you teach. <laughs> It's a, it would be an amazing thing. What is your specialty at, at home? Um, you- so my, my area is the history of the British Empire, but huh? as you can tell, it's kind of wide-ranging these days. So I say I do <laughs> global and world history. So you teach a bunch of different uh, subjects. So that's, that's very interesting. For sure. And what do you say, what do you see of your Harvard students now compared to when I was in school in like 92 or I don't know, or I don't know how many years have been teaching Maya, but I mean, what, what the difference of kids, what do you think the difference in how they're learning history compared to maybe even 10 years ago? I mean, there's no doubt that we now have kids who are coming in, what is it, 2017. So these are kids who were born in 99 and have not known a world um, really since or, or before the, uh, the iPhone. I mean, you know, it's just a different, a different kind of world. And so, you know, I don't know yet how it's all going to shake down, but I think there's no question that people who – have come of age in the social media world, just have different ways of connecting with each other, different ways of uh, connecting with, I think, the material they're learning. You know, it's much more multimedia. It's much more, you know, lots of things going on at once in the classroom. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think as a historian, I'm, I'm concerned that people not lose sight of the fact that things change and that things were different before and that you need to know it. But uh, but it's kind of, it, sometimes today, you're fighting against this this sense that everything is changing incredibly quickly. And I think part of the goal of teaching history today is to show people that, yeah, you know, the surfaces, the technologies are changing really quickly, but the underlying issues about, you know, how we relate as human beings and how societies change and how nations interact, those things have been going on for a long time and they will still keep going on whether or not there's a new iOS coming out. All right. Well, thanks for calling. And, uh, it was a, truly an honor to chat with you, and uh, good luck on your book and all your other ventures. Thanks for calling. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. You're listening bye. to the Neil Haley Show, powered by Life Improvement Radio, live from the Mind Book Fair, and we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you for listening to Life Improvement Radio. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own and shall not be construed in any way as advice from Life Improvement Radio. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our website. Personal perspectives expressed by the producers, writers, or editors will always be presented as such. Any rebroadcast or retransmission without the expressed written consent of Life Improvement Radio is strictly prohibited. Thanks for listening.